Greetings, everyone. Hope you're all doing very well. We're going to get started with church this morning. Hope, hope uh, you're not freezing to death or anything like that. Get you a hymnal if you have one. Find page 85. And we'll try to sing Old Little Town of Bethlehem. see me I, I think I've got it right this time but uh, always good to see you giving me a thumbs up or something all right silent night Oh, 
page 78 in a minute. I uh, want to remind everybody, ask everybody to pray. Pray for our folks, our people, our reservation. Uh, they've lost several of them. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so pray for those who, whose families, pray for, the, for them who've lost loved ones and uh, from this uh, COVID virus and Pray about this thing that the that this thing will that God will take care of this thing. And uh, but uh, I want to challenge you to stay faithful, keep the faith. Just because there's crazy things going on doesn't mean God has lost control. Uh, he's still completely uh, in control. And let's see. Um, encourage you to. Uh, uh, let's see uh, if uh, if you can invite people to join us. And I've already seen some of you doing that. Good job. And uh, uh, for church, we want to we want to get as many people as we can to hear the gospel. And that's what it's all about. And hopefully, you've been keeping up with my messages on what Moses said about Jesus' birth. Now, uh, we've covered four of them, four of the prophecies. And today we're going to get the fifth one. Do you remember what they are? Think about it. See if you can remember what they are. Let's uh, let's sing. Oh, remember, uh, I want to remind y'all, we will, Sophia and I will be leaving on probably the 21st Monday uh, to go to Texas to visit mom. Uh, she can pray for us. But we'll still be having church. And uh, Lord willing, it'll be at the right time and all that. And, but I'll keep you posted. So keep tuning in and uh, to that. And we should be coming back around New Year's, some somewhere around there, New Year's Day or something. And uh, but pray for us about that. All right, page 78. O come, O come, Emmanuel. <clears throat>
Get your Bibles out. Find Genesis 49. All right. Now, uh, as I said a minute ago, this is part five, and we're going to get the fifth of the prophecies that Moses told of Jesus' birth. And uh, these are basically names or titles or uh, whatever of our Lord Jesus Christ. Does anybody remember the titles that we've done so far? What was the first one? The seed of the woman. Very good. Second one? The seed of Abraham. That was the third one. No. No. Nope. You almost said it. Before the scepter was Shiloh. And then the scepter. <laughs> Seems like my wife's the only one who gets any of these. <laughs> no, just kidding. There's the seed of the woman, seed of Abraham, Shiloh, which means peace, and the scepter. Those are the four. Now we're going to get to the fifth one. Now, um, Man sinned. Okay, let's let's read uh, Genesis 49, verse 24. We're going on down a little ways. And uh, it says, But his bow abode in strength, and, his, and the arms of, the hand, of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. We're in Genesis 49, verse 24. Okay. And so, um, uh, and I'm going to catch up to speed on wh what's going on here. Now, he talked to Judah, Jacob, the, the dying uh, Jacob, uh, uh, got his sons all gathered around, all 12 of them. And uh, he had talked to Judah. We find that the seed, the line of the seed of the woman on down uh, is going to go through Judah. And so, but let me uh, just kind of start from the beginning. Man sinned, but God already had a plan to redeem him. The plan, that plan and purpose was wrapped up in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. We find later on. He was the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham. And the line went down through Abraham's son, Isaac, Isaac's son, Jacob. Uh, Jacob had 12 sons. He had pointed out to Judah that the line is coming through you, the bloodline uh, of Christ. And, uh, of course, it eventually uh, went to David and on down. And we find it goes to Joseph and Mary uh, when the New Testament uh, gets here. Okay. But then the line ended. 
it ended in Jesus that was born of Mary. Okay, and uh, uh, now Jacob told Judah he was the one uh, uh, that that Jesus was the one uh, coming called Shiloh. So there's the third one. Uh, it was his first coming. You see, he was Shiloh the first time he came. He came as a little baby. He came in peace. He 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 walked this earth in peace. He came to bring us peace. He died peacefully, giving his life uh, and uh, bringing us, giving us the chance for peace. That's salvation. Okay, that was his first coming. He came to bring salvation, peace, and rest. Now, we're between his first and second coming. Okay, the first time was 2,000 years ago uh, when he came and he died on the cross. The second time is when he's coming in the air and all of his saints, all his children are going to go up to meet him in the air. That's the second coming. And uh, uh, it's a, it's a two-part thing, but the rapture basically is the next thing. That's his second coming. Okay, so... Uh, uh, so, uh, um, but we're between his first and second coming. I'd I'd say, look around. His first coming was a long time ago. We gotta be pretty close to the second coming. If you look around in the world and see what's going on right now, there it, it's it's gotta be close. Okay, his next coming. Now he ain't bringing peace next time. He ain't coming to give the world peace. He did that the first time. He's coming with a scepter. And that's the fourth thing. Dominating, destroying authority. Okay? He's coming next time with, with that and with power. If you're going to get on his side, the Lord's side, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. I wouldn't wait any longer if I was you. I would get on the Lord's side. Okay? Get your soul settled, and with your family, get busy helping them to know the Lord too so they can get their soul settled. All right? You see, you're a part of God's plan and purpose. He wants you so bad that he not only was willing, but did all these things, all of this, to bring you to himself, all these things we've been talking about. But he does leave the complete choice to you. And I just thought of this. Aren't you glad, okay, that he left the choice up to you? You should be thankful that he didn't turn you into a robot and make you accept him or not, okay? That, that, that you ought to be thankful that he lets you choose him, all right? If you reject him, then it won't be his fault because he left the choice up to you. It'll be your fault. You'll instead, if you reject him, you'll know that the wrath of Almighty God should have never been laughed at or mocked or taken lightly. You should have never taken Jesus lightly. You see, he's coming next next time with the scepter. Now, that's the four things. Now, these prophecies are set in stone, okay? Uh, in other words, they're as good as a done deal. You know, I sold the church van yesterday. Done and done. <laughs> All right. The old church van. Don't, we got her in. <laughs> uh, but it's a done deal. It's, it's, it's finished. It's finalized. When God does something, he does it. Okay? It's done. They're as good as done because they were promised by God. And as we've seen, God promised these things would happen. And they've come to pass exactly like he said, down to the smallest detail. All of these prophecies of, of the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of uh, or, or on through his children, uh, all of these prophecies of uh, Shiloh and uh, uh, and all that, they, they've come to pass. You know, they say, and I haven't ever studied or looked it up or anything for myself, but they say there's some 330-something prophecies about Jesus alone, about his first coming, okay, that were fulfilled in his first coming. 
the, the first time Jesus came, there were there were 300 and something prophecies about his first coming. The odds of, of them accidentally happening exactly as they were foretold after uh, having been foretold, the, the odds of them happening mathematically are impossible. Did you know that? You'd have to, you'd have a better chance of randomly winning the lottery like 50,000 times in a row than for, for everything to have happened exactly as they happened with Jesus in his first coming, okay? For it to be an accident. People try to say, oh, that just, you know, this lines up and that lines up and it was just a coincidence. No, no, it couldn't have been a coincidence. The only reasonable explanation to justify it is that he is God and he prophesied it and he knows what he's doing. And he, you know, uh, he has to be God. So if God promises he's coming next time in wrath, in power, in judgment, he means it. If he promised, there's literally a hell to pay for all who reject him, then there is. Okay, if he promised that uh, the hell that was prepared for the devil and his angels would be filled with souls of people who choose to side with self and sin and Satan, then it's true whether you believe it or not. God prophesies and it comes to pass. It happens. He's uh, All of his prophecies have either happened exactly already or some of them might not have happened yet, but mark them down they will. These things ought to help us and encourage us as Christians to know that he is God and that he's coming soon and we're going to get raptured or taken out of this place. Okay, So we come on down um, uh, with Jacob on his deathbed. Now this is the story in Genesis 49. Jacob, uh, who has the 12 sons, he's on his deathbed and uh, he's prophesying to each of his sons from the oldest to the youngest. He comes to his 11th and favorite son. What was the name of the 11th one? Joseph. Very good. Okay. Joseph. Now listen, it's not Joseph that was married to Mary. It's not Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus in the New Testament. We're talking Joseph, Jacob's favorite son, the one he bought him the coat of many colors. He got him uh, the coat of many colors and uh, Joseph. Okay. Uh, that story. That's who he's talking to in verse 24 here. Before he was talking to Judah, and we found Shiloh and the scepter, but uh, in that line, now he's talking to Joseph, all right, his 11th son. Uh, though Jesus is not in the line of Joseph, this prophecy by Jacob is another picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jacob, on his deathbed, who had seen the sorrows of sin and the goodness of God, he comes on down and his eyes land on Joseph. It's Joseph's turn. With only a few breaths left before he dies, Jacob's going to give his prophecies and talk to his sons and he's going to die. All right. With, with a few breaths left, he looks at Joseph and sees an example of his Savior, okay, that's coming in the future. And, his, and he's reminded, Jacob is reminded of the one. He just mentioned to Judah, who's coming to bring peace, okay? The Shiloh, and, uh, and, and whom he's fixing to see. He's fixing to die and go see the Savior, Jesus, okay? And uh, he's reminded of, and he sees Joseph, and, uh, and, and I think he looks and he sees a picture of, of the one uh, whose life, who lived such a good life uh, for the Lord and all that, that uh, he's such an example of Jesus. And, uh, and he's reminded of that, okay? And, uh, and so <clears throat> uh, G jo uh, Jacob is fixing to rest in peace. He's had a life of, of, of ups and downs, but now he's fixing to get to rest. Now you see, Joseph is a picture of the shepherd and the stone. Look in your verse again, verse 24 of Genesis 49. But his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. Remember 
Do you remember back uh, the story of Joseph um, when he was younger and he was the son uh, of, of Jacob's favorite wife, okay, uh, Rachel? Yeah. And, uh, uh, and she finally had a child and it was Joseph and boy, he was the favorite son of, of old Jacob and uh, the child of his old age and all that. And, uh, and here's Jacob and uh, here's Joseph. And remember, Joseph had some dreams that he was going to rule and that the, his family was going to bow down to him. He told his brothers about it. He told his dad about it. In Genesis 37, 11, the Bible says, and his brethren envied him. I mean, they hated him. But his father observed the same. Who's his father? It's Jacob, the one that's now lying on his deathbed talking to his sons. His dad observed the saying. He, he listened and thought, I wonder if God's doing something here. Joseph's telling us of these dreams. Surely we're not all going to bow down to him, but I wonder if he's telling us something here. Now, long after much of that had been fulfilled and they were in Egypt and they all bowed down uh, to, to Joseph and his son that was dead became alive again to him, okay, he had observed the saying, now Jacob's dying and all, think about this now, all 11 of Joseph's brothers and their families, they're all a bunch of shepherds in Egypt, okay? They're servants to Egypt, but not Joseph. Joseph comes in with his brothers, but Joseph is second in command of Egypt. He's, he's the head of Egypt in essence, okay? Other than the Pharaoh himself, Joseph is in command of the world empire. He's not a shepherd. He's, he's in command. But the shepherd. So Jacob mentions this about the shepherd. Okay. Now on his deathbed, Jacob sees that God was, do, was the doer of it all. That he had been uh, busy working his plan and purpose all along. Jacob knows what God had done and worked in his life. Okay. And Jacob saw what God had done in Joseph's life. Okay, now we want to read Genesis 49. We're going to read verse 22 through 24. It says, Joseph, here he comes to Joseph. He starts talking to him. He says, Joseph is a fruitful bow or bow. Um, uh, a bow is a limb or a branch or part of a vine or a tree. Okay, he's a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by a well, well watered. Okay, whose branches run over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. His enemies and everybody in the world have been against him, uh, shooting against him and trying to destroy him and kill him. But his bow, now this is talking about his bow and arrow. Okay? Uh, his bow abode in strength and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. Okay, Joseph's hands were made strong with his bow and in his life because of the mighty God of Jacob. Okay, now here's Joe. Remember the story. Remember his brothers sold him into slavery. They were going to kill him and they went up selling him as a slave and he ended up in Potiphar's house. And uh, Potiphar was the captain of the guard, I believe, uh, or the captain of the prison or whatever. Anyways, uh, uh, Potiphar's wife, uh, you know, tried to take him, you know, uh, for herself and he rejected and she lied to him and they had put him in prison and then he was in prison. He hadn't done nothing wrong. And his whole life, the enemies had shot arrows at him. He was troubled on every side, surrounded, if you will. Okay. And, uh, but each time he served God, each time, each moment, each instance, each situation, each day, he served God. God and trusted God and maintained his integrity and did that which was right. Each time God exalted him. Pretty soon he went from being a slave and a prisoner to second in command of the land. And he was the one that interpreted the Pharaoh's dream that there's going to be seven years of, of plenty and seven years of famine. And he's the one that came up with the way of saving their people. 
okay, and not just their people, but his own family. And the prophecy came true of his dream, and his family, his dad, and his brothers, and all of them, they bowed down and worshiped him. Okay, it came to pass. All right. Now, if in the middle of that verse it says, it says his arms were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob, then now Jacob stops and prophesies of the one who would come, not from Joseph, but from the mighty God himself. God's going to do a work. Joseph's just the example. He says, from thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. So the fifth, the fifth prophecy Moses gives of the coming Savior, of the coming Messiah, of the promised seed, is the shepherd. Now the sixth one is going to be a stone. We're not going to get into that today. Uh, but uh, he's a shepherd and a stone. So we're going to look at the fifth unusual prophecy Moses gives of Jesus' birth. The shepherd. Okay, Joseph was second in command of the world. Strangely, through his sufferings and attacks from all uh, enemy forces all around, Joseph didn't falter or waver under the load of unfairness and trouble and, and attack and, and anger and vengeance and hate and all of that against him with his own family and with other people. Okay, he didn't waver. He didn't falter. He maintained his integrity through it all. He trusted God and did right through it all. You see, his strength, get this now, his strength was in God, not in himself. God highly exalted Joseph and used him greatly because of his faithfulness. I think he could have forfeited all of the blessings, and his family would have perished if he hadn't stayed faithful to God. Note to us, if you'll stay true and faithful to God through all the hard times, no matter how hard they get, no matter how long they go on, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how long the night of weeping, if you'll stay faithful, rest assured, joy does come in the morning. If I can give you example, uh, an example of that, just look at your screen right now at the one standing in front of me. I'm the example. Okay? Uh, all right? Uh, God blesses those who stay faithful. Joseph became the shepherd and stone, the caregiver, feeder, and supporter of God's people, Israel. Okay, now in essence, the whole world, because all the land surrounding Egypt, okay, Joseph was uh, in essence, physically speaking, the savior of them all, the one that provided in the, uh, for, for the whole known world, uh, the, this world empire, okay? And, uh, and so uh, Egypt might have been lost had not Joseph been there to save them. Joseph is one of the best types or pictures of Christ. Christ who was targeted, hated, plotted against, yet he remained strong under the heavy load of it all to the very end. And he came to be the shepherd and the stone. Jesus, who brought us peace by way of, okay, by way of the cross, was foretold or prophesied to be our shepherd. Now, the three shepherds, uh, I'm sorry, the three shepherd psalms. Does anybody know who the, what the, what's the shepherd psalm? Which psalm is it? In the Psalm 23, that's exactly right. The three shepherd psalms are 22, 23, and 24. Did you know that? They show three kinds of shepherds. All right? These show three kinds of shepherds that Jesus is. All right? As spoken of in the New Testament. And we're going to look at these. And I'll go ahead and list them to you. The first one is the good shepherd. The second one is the great shepherd. 
The third one is the chief shepherd. Okay, that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, first of all, the good shepherd. You might have heard the quote, America is great because America is good. When America stops being good, she'll stop being great. I'm not sure actually who came up with that. Uh, it's been quoted by many of our presidents and whatnot, and, uh, but uh, I don't know who actually came up with it. But think about that. America is great because America is good. When America stops being good, she'll stop being great. May I say we're almost there. America is becoming less and less good. America is becoming more and more selfish and less and less Christian. And that's why America is, is not being as good as it used to be. And it's not as great as it used to be. But here's my point. Goodness and greatness are different. Did you know that? Greatness, here's what greatness is. It's having qualities, talents, intelligence, beauty, whatever, that make one, makes a person recognized, adored, followed. We say, oh, that person's great because he's done this awesome thing or he's you know, got this awesome thing about him and everybody knows about it. But here's what goodness is. Goodness is doing acts of kindness out of a heart of love and mercy and compassion. It's being good, being nice, being kind to people and wanting nothing in return for that matter. One can be great and not be good. Think about that. There are many famous people that the world says they're great. They're great at basketball or they're great at uh, uh, singing or they're great at uh, uh, something, they're, they're an intelligent mind, or they're something, they're, they're, they're a beautiful, attractive person that, uh, that you know, that uh, is an actor or whatever. And the world calls them great. But, and they have people that worship them, okay, their fans worship them. Many of these fans, if they were to ever meet the person, the, their hero that they worship, they would find out that they'd end up being terribly disappointed and find this famous great person to be cold and mean and arrogant and selfish. Isn't it true that many of them are like that? They're great because the world shows them or that we see them doing something great or something great about them. But it doesn't mean they're good. There may not be anything good in them. right? They may just look good or sound good or do something good. Okay, they may be great, but they ain't good. However, Jesus is the good shepherd. I want you to turn your Bibles to John chapter 10. Okay, Jesus is the good shepherd. Now, we're going to read a lot of this, and I'm going to try to go quickly. All right, John chapter 10, we're going to read verse 1 through 18. This is a passage in the New Testament that tells of the good shepherd. Right, And Jesus is talking about, uh, is saying this about himself. Verse 1, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Remember I showed you the lineage, the genealogy of Joseph and Mary, and we proved that Jesus came in by the door. Okay, He didn't come in over the wall. He's not a thief or a robber. He is the heir, okay, to the throne. He is the rightful one, the chosen one, the seed that was promised. Okay, and the genealogy proves that. And, uh, and so he says that, but verse 2 says, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. 
By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. This is what makes him good now. He says, but he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. The hireling fleeth because he is an hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, uh, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and shall uh, be one fold and one shepherd. Therefore, uh, I think I'm on the right thing there. Therefore, doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down on myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. What is it that makes him the good shepherd? Well, it's doing something good. Laying down your life for someone is doing a very good thing. Okay? All right? So, how did our shepherd lay down his life. You can read it, and we won't turn there today, but you can read it in Psalms 22. Psalms 22 is the shepherd psalm of the good shepherd. Okay? Read it sometime. You'll find, uh, uh, you'll find Jesus treated as a worm, reproached, despised, laughed at, mocked at, surrounded by bulls and dogs, uh, chewed up by lions, a body shredded, bones out of joint, hands and feet pierced. Now I want you to imagine a lowly shepherd. What's a shepherd do? He's out there in the field. He's not bothering anybody else. He's just taking care of the sheep. People pass him by on the road and they see and they or they don't even see him. They don't recognize, don't even know he's there, don't even care. He's a lowly person. Imagine this lowly shepherd being the target of the world, the world targeting him as the enemy and doing all they can to destroy him. But no matter what they did, they couldn't stop the shepherd. They couldn't hinder him. They couldn't change him. They couldn't even discourage the love that he had for the sheep. In fact, the more they did to him, against him, the more he loved them and pressed on harder and harder, which of course brought even more persecution, more trouble. And what did Jesus, our good shepherd, do? He loved and gave himself for the sheep. And for that, he was accused, attacked, arrested. He was tried, judged, condemned, beaten, mocked, and crucified for loving his sheep. He died for you. And he didn't complain that it should have been you dying, that he did nothing wrong. Nope. He was glad to do it. Our shepherd loved the sheep so much that he was not only willing, but he did die for us. And he didn't die resistantly, reluctantly. He died for us gladly. He's the good shepherd because he died for us. He died being glad to die. He said, I get to go die for them. I get to do it so they don't have to. How many mothers would say, I would die in my child's place? If a child has is, is been uh, killed, how many parents would say, I wish it could have been me. I wish I could have done that instead of them. Now imagine a shepherd would be willing to die for a lowly sheep. That's what Jesus did for us. He was glad to do it. He really is the good shepherd. You know, I think they're right when they say a hero isn't someone 
with great superpowers. It's just regular people who give up and sacrifice self for someone else. It's firemen who run into the burning building while others are running out to save the ones that can't get out or whatever. Okay? It's, it's soldiers who fight and even die to protect us or to give us freedom. Okay? It's, it's the dads and moms who work and sacrifice their self so that they can give their kids all that they can. It's the ones who do good deeds, even if they get laughed at or mistreated. And they're not ashamed to do it. In fact, they do it again and go through all the mockery and all of that again and again, because they're glad to do it for that one they love. Listen to me, no one else cared for that ugly, dirty, crippled sheep. But the good shepherd did. He sacrificed everything to go save it, to go rescue it, to keep it from being lost forever. That sheep was you, by the way. Amen. That sheep was me. He's the good shepherd because he laid down his life for the sheep. Right? So, Jacob's prophecy here is of the good shepherd. Then it's of the great shepherd. Hebrews 13, you can turn there if you want to. I'm going to quote it. Uh, verses 20 and 21 says this. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21 says, Now the God of peace, sound like the one we're talking about? Shiloh, huh? Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You see, he not only died to save you as the good shepherd, but he rose in power. Amen. He's the good shepherd because he did something so good for us. He's the great shepherd because he is great. He is God. He rose in power. He's not a superhero. There's no such thing, by the way. He's God Almighty. That's what Jacob reminded Joseph of, wasn't it? Your arms, Joseph, are made strong by the mighty God of Jacob. Jesus, our great shepherd, he lives to help us. What does a shepherd do? He protects, corrects, and directs. The sheep. Amen? Which psalm does that sound like? Psalm 23, right? He leadeth me beside the still waters. Okay? He, he uh, leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. He, he uh, uh, you know, all of that. And that, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm getting to. You see? Uh, he's the great shepherd who takes care of us. Sheep are weak, ignorant, foolish, helpless creatures. <laughs> and that describes man to a T. We're, we're, we're completely worthless and useless. We can't do anything on our own. Sheep will wander off. They'll overeat, even to the point of death. They'll drown themselves trying to get a drink of water out of a stream that, that is troubled. Okay? They need constant attention and care. Psalms 23 shows how the great shepherd is always there to give his love, his comfort, and his faithfulness. Okay? To meet the daily needs of his sheep and give them direction and hope. He's the good shepherd because he died for us. The great shepherd because he's God Almighty with all power. He rose in power, and he wants to give that power to us, and he wants to walk with us and talk with us and be with us all the time and take care of us and guide us and, and change us. You see, he can do what can't be done. He takes a worthless sheep 
and transforms it into a king or a priest, into a warrior, a conqueror, a sheep. How can a sheep be a king? How can a sheep be a warrior that can't be defeated? I, I imagine sheep that go out there and beat up and scare off a pack of wolves all by itself. Only God can do that. He's our great shepherd. No longer is it a worthless sheep, but a force to be reckoned with. Okay? Uh, a strong, bold person that the world sees and can't deny. And still, still can't hardly believe it. Some of you out there were rotten and wicked and horrible and terrible and mean and violent people drinking or who knows what all else and, and and to the point that people said i know him i know her she's such and such and boy you better stay away from him but then you got saved and god changed you and started walking with you and making you listen to the great shepherd and then people start saying are you the one i think you are because you look like him but you ain't the same one <clears throat> doesn't Corinthians say if any man be in Christ he is a new creature amen how how do you become a new creature by God being there by the great shepherd being there with you constantly working what was it it said in the in, in Hebrews 13 there where we read our, our text on this point said that he works in you to do his will. That's what makes him great, is that he can make you great, make you something when you're nothing, and change you and do great things with you and in you and through you by walking with you and teaching you and training you, by correcting you uh, and directing you and protecting you. By letting you see him there with you every day by letting you get to know him and, and giving you his power to do anything. Doesn't the Bible say with God all things are possible? He teaches me how to eat. Doesn't, doesn't Psalms 23 say that? He leadeth me in the uh, uh, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He takes me to good green places. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He, he teaches me what and how to drink. Okay. By the way, if you're being taught to drink alcohol, uh, you ain't listening to the great shepherd. You're following the wrong one. Okay. God's going to teach you how to drink the, the right things and not the wrong things. He teaches me to be holy and to be thankful. He teaches how and when to rest. Read Psalms 23. He, he teaches us how to enjoy life and not worry. Teaches you how to live right. Doesn't it talk about the paths of righteousness? Lead me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. <clears throat> teaches me how to march forward when I'm afraid. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Why? Why can I do it? How can I do it? Because he's right there with me. He's the great shepherd. He's got his rod and his staff to protect me and to guide me along the way. Amen. That's good stuff, Pastor Andy. Yes, I'm so thankful that he's my good shepherd who died for me, but I also praise him that he's been there with me and for me, guarding and guiding and growing me. He's the great shepherd. Now, the last thing is this, and I'm going faster than I thought I would, so we might wrap it up early today. What is the first one? He's the... Okay. What's the second one? <laughs> second one. Seed of Abraham. What's the third one? Shiloh. So that's the fourth one. The scepter. Okay, now the fifth one is... The shepherd, okay? Now, of the three kinds of shepherd, we've covered two of them. What's the first shepherd? Good shepherd. That's Psalms 22, we find. 
What is the second one? The great shepherd, Psalms 23. Now we come to the chief shepherd. Chief is another name or title for king or ruler of a people. Isn't that what they call in the Indian tribes, especially, especially years ago, they had the chief, the chief of the tribe. He was the king, the ruler, the head of the tribe. 1 Peter 5 verse 4 says this, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Real simple. This speaks of a time in the future when the chief shepherd will come and gather all his sheep. Those who've heard his voice and followed him. And this one we find in Psalms 24. Okay, the, the chief shepherd psalm. All right, it says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Okay, that's verse 1. In verses 7 and 8, it talks about, it says, The king of the king of, glo of glory, who's the Lord, strong and mighty, shall come in. He's going to come in the gate. All right, he's going to come into his kingdom. Right now, only his sheep know him. Did you know that? In this world, the kingdoms of the world and the rulers of the world and the world itself, the world of lost people, they don't know him. Many countries, many cultures worship other gods, and they don't know the chief shepherd. They don't, they don't know him yet. All right? And most of the world rejects him or denies him or don't care or ain't interested, don't think he's even great, don't think he's all that good. Okay? They don't know his voice. But his sheep know his voice. Those who are saved know his voice. And they know who he is. They know how good he is. We Don't we? And we know how great he is. He goes with us and he walks with us and he guides and directs and protects and takes care of us, he cares for us. But pretty soon, and I think it's going to be pretty soon, the whole world will know who is the one who is the chief shepherd. He's going to be chief shepherd of all the earth. He'll divide the sheep from the goats. And he'll put his sheep on the right hand, on his right hand, and he'll put the goats on his left hand. Matthew 25, verse 34. Go read that. Okay, uh, that, that one's up a little higher, but down in verse 34, it says, Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. But then you go to verse 41 says, Then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. I'm going to ask you, as I did on Wednesday night, which side are you on? Are you on God's side? Or are you on the devil's side? You're on the side of the king of kings who's going to come through his gate and he's going to be served and worshipped and recognized as the chief shepherd, the king of this whole earth, the Lord Almighty? Or are you going to stand against him thinking you can win with the Antichrist and the devil and the beast and the false prophet and all that? Which side are you on? Now I'm going to wrap it up. The word pastor means shepherd. I get to be a pastor, okay, uh, to, to shepherd a flock. You people here in Mescalero, anyways, here in this area, y'all are my people. Y'all are my flock. It's a great honor to pastor a church, okay? It really is. But I know that I'm not a great pastor, <laughs> okay? All right? Uh, even among pastors, if, if you look at other pastors, other preachers that uh, uh, are more well-known and recognized, who, who no doubt preach a lot better sermons and have, have more knowledge and uh, uh, dig in there and find and discover things a lot better than I do in the Bible, okay? I'm probably the least of all of them. Least noticed, least honored, but that's okay. I'm not trying to be great, okay? 
but I do want to be good. Do you see the difference? I want to be nice. I want to be right. I want to be fair. I want to help people. I want to help you know the Savior. I want to help you know the Good Shepherd and get saved. And once you get saved, I want to help you to grow and to walk with Him and let Him guide you and let Him provide everything and direct you and take care of everything. Okay? And hopefully, one day the Chief Shepherd will come with a reward for me. I'd like to get at least one reward. I think that'd be nice. If you have kids, did you know you're a shepherd? You are. You've got a little flock. If you have a Sunday school class or some other class that you teach, uh, if you have people that work under you, do you know they're a flock? And in a sense, you're the shepherd. You should live letting the great shepherd change you and grow you and make you into something wonderful and better. A servant of God that, that can do anything because you walk with the one who has all power. And then you should make sure that those little sheep under you know the shepherd. Make sure they know the good shepherd that'll save them. Make sure they know who he is. Make sure they know what the Bible says. Make sure they know this God. <clears throat> and then they can get to know him as the great shepherd and walk with him. And one day, we'll all get to know him as the chief shepherd. Jacob, in conclusion, Jacob prophesied to Joseph and his brothers that there's a shepherd coming. Who's a good shepherd? He's a great shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. You see, the good shepherd laid down his life to save you from the penalty of sin. The great shepherd rose again in power and lives to walk with you to save you from the power of sin. The chief shepherd will one day save us from the presence of sin. The good shepherd loves you and wants you no matter how lowly you are. Remember, remember in the Christmas story, who was the first ones? that the angels revealed the new Christ child to? It was the shepherds. Exactly right. They were very lowly, overlooked by the world, rejected and put down and walked on and, and all that. But they weren't overlooked by God. Are you a lost sheep, wandering alone, trying to do everything on your own? It's a dangerous world out there. I need a shepherd. Uh, correct that. I need the shepherd. The good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. That's what Joseph, Jacob prophesied through Joseph. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. If you have any need to for salvation or anything, you'd like to know the shepherd, please contact me. I'd like to be glad to help you with that. Or if you need some counsel or anything, um, I'd like to help you with that too. I'd be glad to. But let's pray. Our Father, we come to you today and just pray that you bless us now. Forgive us where we fail you in sin. Thank you, Father, for being our shepherd. How wonderful you are. And Lord, for those who don't know you, have never met you, Lord, they're missing out on the greatest experience that there is to know and love and walk with and get to be with the shepherd of eternity. Bless those who are lost and save them. Bless uh, those who are saved. Help us to grow and draw closer to you. We pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hope uh, that God will bless you and you have a Merry Christmas. We will talk to you uh, when we can and we'll see you later. Until then, Pastor Randy, signing off.